continue. Um, so tonight we have a very special guest, Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins is a physician geneticist known for his landmark discoveries of disease genes, for spearheading the Human Genome Project, for his 12 years as director of the National Institutes of Health, and for championing the harmony of science and faith. Um, he currently serves as senior investigator in the National, Uni National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH. Dr. Collins served as NIH director under three presidents, Obama, Tr Trump, and Biden, stepping down in December 2021 after guiding our nation's biomedical research and everything from basic science to clinical trials, including a historic series of research partnerships addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, before turning the meeting over to Dr. Collins, there's just a couple items I need to cover. Um, the meeting is scheduled for one hour. We, um, there, you may have received an invite stating it was until 7 15 in your invitation. That's not correct. We will be ending the meeting at 7 or 7 to sometime in an hour from now. I um, want to mention briefly if you're not currently subscribed to Braver Angels email updates, you can do so by going to braverangels.org, scrolling to the bottom. You can sign up for email updates using the link. And um, if there are future events around this topic, you'd be notified. Um, the public health response to COVID-19 it, it has been and continues to be a sensitive and a polarizing topic. So what we're doing is all, you'll notice all the participants in this meeting have been muted. Um, we have, um, we've done this to ensure that the Q&A is not monopolized and we get to hear from as many different voices as our time allows. Um, as a participant, you can submit your questions via the internet using the URL in the, you see in the chat function in the Zoom meeting. Martin has set that up. The other co-chairs and I will receive your questions and be able to review them and assimilate them. And we'll, we'll present the questions to Dr. Collins when he's ready for Q&A. So with that, um, I wanna thank Dr. Collins on behalf of Brain Your Angels and the Tucson Alliance welcome you to our event and thank you for taking the time and i'm going to turn the meeting over to you well thank you tom and good evening everyone i'm speaking to you from my home office in chevy chase maryland uh, so it's a little later here than where you are but i'm glad to have a chance to spend an hour with you i'm not going to talk for the whole hour i'm not exactly sure how long my comments will take but i hope there will be plenty of time uh, for the Q&A. And as you saw, there's a way you can submit your questions. So don't wait until the end. I'm sure they'd be glad to see questions start to come in all the way along as I'm going through some introductory comments and perspectives about our topic, uh, which is the public health system and the trust in public health, which has clearly taken a pretty hard hit in the course of the last four years, especially in the context of COVID-19. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself and then particularly about the experience of serving as uh, the director of the National Institutes of Health during COVID-19 and perhaps then some context about what went right and what went wrong and maybe some ideas about what lessons we could learn uh, from those experiences. So many thanks to Tom Plosky uh, for organizing a lot of the details, at least for me here and to all the team. And also to my friend Mark Lauterbach, who I understand is in Serbia, so he gets a pass for not being here this evening, uh, doing good works uh, teaching over there. I'm a scientist. I'm a physician trained in internal medicine. My own research has been in the field of human genetics. I'm fascinated by how we might be able to use the tools of science to uncover causes and ultimately ways to prevent and treat really terrible diseases that cause a lot of human suffering. My initial research back in the day when I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is now more than 30 years ago, was devoted to trying to understand the cause of a disease called cystic fibrosis. And it was my lab together with another lab and uh, 
Toronto, Canada, that discovered that cause. And it is a source of great joy and thankfulness uh, to be able to say that we now have a treatment just in the last couple of years, it took a long time, where 90% of individuals with cystic fibrosis uh, have with an oral medication dramatic benefits that allows them to start thinking about retirement instead of worrying about exactly how many more months they might have to live because it's been such a struggle for so many of these folks. Right now, as you heard, I'm a senior investigator in the Genome Institute at NIH running a research lab with about a dozen highly energetic, visionary uh, young trainees and a few more senior people. And we're studying type 2 diabetes that causes an awful lot of difficulties uh, in the whole world and trying to understand the genetic factors and what we could do with that information to try to prevent or better treat this very common disease. We also study one of the rarest diseases, something called progeria, which is a dramatic form of premature aging. And these kids appear normal at birth, but then start aging at about seven times the normal rate. My research lab discovered the cause of this, and it's just a one letter misspelling in that DNA instruction book, but in a very vulnerable place. And we're now on the trail of a path forward that we think could ultimately provide dramatic benefits and maybe even a cure, but it's a lot of hard work and it will take a few more years of work to see if that's actually practical. I was called back in 1993 uh, to come to NIH, leaving my position at Michigan, which is what I thought I was going to be doing for my whole life, and serve as the director of this thing that Tom mentioned, the Human Genome Project. This was a bold effort, uh, an international effort, ultimately involving six countries and about 20 labs, to read out a reference copy of the Human DNA Instruction Book something that we in research now take for granted because people use it every day, every minute as sort of basic information about what exactly is the inheritance that we've received from our parents. And yet at the time the Genome Project was being proposed, it was rather controversial. Uh, people weren't sure it was going to work. It was my job to try to pull all of the parties together to invent some new technologies to figure out how to organize the effort so that all the data would be immediately accessible to everybody. And it was white knuckles uh, for most of the 1990s, but fortunately it all kind of came together. And ultimately we finished that project two years ahead of schedule and uh, well under the projected budget, which doesn't happen very often with uh, scientific projects funded by the federal government. I think Human Genome Project will be seen uh, by historians over time as one of the most significant things that we humans have done scientifically, maybe right up there with splitting the atom or going to the moon, except this was a adventure into ourselves to read out those letters, all three billion of them, that basically carry the instructions uh, to take you from what we all once were, a single cell, into this incredibly complicated, beautiful, amazing organism called the human being. After that, I did some other things trying to understand how to read those three billion letters because it's written in a funny script that we were not very good at understanding at first. But then I was asked uh, to step up and serve as the director of the National Institutes of Health, which oversees biomedical research for our whole country. When you hear about a breakthrough of some sort in cancer or Alzheimer's or diabetes or some rare disease like sickle cell disease, if it was done in the United States in an academic institution, it was probably funded by the National Institutes of Health. That's how our system works. It's all decided on the basis of rigorous peer review, and we think we do it pretty well, but we could always do it better. That was an amazing experience to have that opportunity to oversee all of that, working with some 27 institute directors who reported to me, but who were all themselves spectacular internationally known scientists. We got to start some new projects, things like a project to understand how the brain works, that amazing organ, organ that you have between your ears with its 86 billion neurons. We've got a long ways to go to really figure that out, but it is coming along. Uh, started another project on precision medicine, trying to understand how we could go from one-size-fits-all approaches to health 
uh, situation where we take account of individual differences in environmental exposures and health behaviors and genetics and optimize the way that we keep people healthy or manage illness if it happens. That's also making great progress. Uh, when Obama uh, finished his second term, I assumed that I would be leaving the role as NIH director, but President Trump asked me to stay. And so I served in that role for another four years. And when he left and Biden arrived, I was asked to stay on for a while. That's the longest anybody has ever been in this role of NIH director. And after 12 years, I concluded it was time for somebody else to do this. And so I stepped down from that in December of 2021. I'm not a particularly political person, as you might guess by what I've just told you. I've never registered with a political party. My real passion is about medical research, which until recently has pretty much been something that everybody agreed was important uh, and didn't necessarily have particularly strong political overtones. Another thing I want to tell you about me is that I'm a person of faith. That was not always the case. I was raised in a home where faith was not considered particularly relevant. By the time I got to college, I was a skeptic and agnostic. By the time I got to graduate school studying physical chemistry, I was frankly an atheist. I didn't have any use for people talking about things that you couldn't measure using the tools of science. But then I went to medical school because I felt this calling to have my science have something closer to humanity. And in those moments where, as a medical student, I found myself face to face with life and death, which is happening all around you in a hospital in your training, I realized I didn't have very good answers uh, to what to do about this. I knew that medicine wasn't successful a lot of the times in saving people from terrible diseases. And I watched how some of them basically leaned on their faith to carry them through. And I wondered, what would I do in that situation? And why is it that people believe anyway? And at one particular moment, a patient of mine who was an elderly woman who was going through a lot with terrible chest pains, I was a very dedicated Christian. And after one of her very personal descriptions of why that gave her peace in the midst of what clearly was a very strong limitation in the time she had left, she just turned to me and asked very simply, what do you believe, doctor? Well, I wasn't even quite a doctor yet, but I sure didn't know what to do with that question. And I realized that's probably the most important question that I've ever been asked or that anybody ever gets asked. And yet I haven't spent much time trying to sort that out. So I began a journey trying to understand why people who are sensible in other ways could actually believe in God. And that took me down a lot of pathways and ultimately through the careful assistance of a pastor who lived down the street from me and the reading that I was pointed to in the works of C.S. Lewis, I began to realize that faith was actually the most rational of all the options, that atheism was the least rational because it was saying, I'm so smart, I can deny the possibility of God. Well, that didn't sound like a very wise thing for a scientist to do. And I also discovered that the person of Jesus, who I had assumed was a myth, was actually this profoundly compelling historical figure about whom we knew an awful lot, including uh, his teachings and, yes, also his death on the cross. And most amazing of all, this claim that he was resurrected and that there were eyewitnesses to that. It took me a while uh, struggling with that information to ultimately come around to it. But eventually, it made the most perfect sense. And so when I, at age 27, became a Christian, uh, that was 45 years ago, I have never found an instance where my faith and what I know about science conflict with each other. There are plenty of times where interpretations may be discordant, but these are both gifts from God. God gave us the two books that uh, was talked about by Francis Bacon, the book of God's words, which is the Bible, which I read almost every day, and the book of God's works, which is nature. And it doesn't make sense that they would be in conflict with each other. So that's another part of who I am. But I know we want to talk about public health. And I know we particularly want to talk about what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I had been in my role 
uh, under President Trump already uh, for two and a half, three years, when that moment arrived in early January of 2020, where clearly something bad was happening in Wuhan, China. By January 10th of that year, we had actually on the internet, the letters of the sequence uh, of the virus that we now call SARS-CoV-2. And it was clear it was a coronavirus and it was unlike one we had really seen before. It was a bit mysterious. And the initial insights weren't that clear about just how infectious this was gonna be, but we took it very seriously. And within 48 hours, the vaccine design had already been put in place. And just 60 days later, the very first patient was being injected with the what's called a phase one trial of that vaccine using this mRNA technology, which had been under development for about 25 years uh, and seemed like it might be the best way to get a vaccine as quickly as possible because by March, it was clear this was a virus that was spreading rapidly and with great devastating consequences. I don't know how much people remember of what it was like back in March. Sometimes I think maybe even myself, I'm kind of suppressed just how scary a time that was. We were watching what was happening across the world. Italy was being just absolutely slammed. And when we saw the curves of what was happening in Italy and projected that the US was probably uh, two or three weeks behind, it was clear this seemed like an exponential curve. And so a lot of things seemed like they needed to get done. But I will be honest, at that point, we didn't really know nearly enough about this virus to be quite sure what to expect. And so it was necessary to make recommendations, things like flattening the curve to try to prevent the hospitals from being utterly overloaded because already uh, there were circumstances in some places where the ICUs couldn't handle all the patients and even the morgue couldn't handle all the dead bodies. My job as the NIH uh, director was to make sure we were doing everything humanly possible in the research arena. That meant pulling together partnerships between academia and government and industry to try to build a plan to make these vaccines at a pace never before attempted, assisted by the resources provided by the Trump administration in something called Operation Warp Speed. I also was charged with trying to look and see were there any existing drugs that had been used for some other purpose that might be beneficial in COVID-19. Uh, one of them, remdesivir, turned out to be so. Most of the others initially didn't look very promising, but we had to have a systematic way of looking at that. To test the vaccines, we had to develop what you'd call a master protocol to be sure that we really knew once they were tested, are they safe and effective? And that meant enrolling at least 30,000 volunteers for each of the four vaccines that were gonna go through the early trials. My gratitude will always be there for the people who were willing to sign up because this is what's called a randomized trial where you didn't know if you were in this trial, whether you were getting the vaccine or a dummy shot uh, of salt water. But you would be followed then to see what happened over the course of the coming weeks. Did you get COVID or did you not? And of course, COVID was spreading rapidly across the country. So lots of people did get exposed. This was what's called a double blind trial. So even the people running the trial didn't know going forward who got the real vaccine and who got the placebo. And a time came in the late fall where that particular blinding was going to be removed and we would actually see the results. And I will not forget that evening where the results were revealed for the Pfizer trial and just a few days later for the Moderna trial. I had hoped that maybe this vaccine would be 50% effective because that's often the best you do with vaccines like the flu and I hoped it would be safe. And when the data was unveiled, it was so much better than I would have guessed, 90 to 95% effective. And for those 30,000 people where you had the opportunity to compare people who got the vaccine and people who didn't, there didn't seem to be any obvious serious safety effect. We found out later that a rare kind of effect happened to young men in terms of the myocarditis 
that has affected maybe one in 10,000 young men, but is fortunately reversible. But in the 30,000 initial trials, it looked great. So I was in this space, safe uh, state after working 100 hours a week for most of 2020, of feeling like we've got something, we're gonna be able to get through this, we're gonna save a lot of the lives that otherwise are at risk. And that did happen. The current estimates are in the US alone, the vaccines saved 3 million lives. But of course, not everybody saw this as something they wanted to take advantage of. There was a lot of information that was circulating that made these vaccines sound less than safe. Maybe they were rushed. Um, various rumors flying around about whether there was something in them, like cells from aborted fetuses, or whether there was chips from Bill Gates. And then social media didn't help very much with other kinds of claims. People of faith got pulled into this, particularly worrying about what was the story about whether this had been developed using cell lines that were derived from a therapeutic abortion many decades earlier. Um, um, other even more religious claims that this might not be of God, this might be the mark of the beast if you got yourself injected. As you know, I'm a person of faith. I was particularly troubled about that. I did all kinds of podcasts with people like Rick Warren and Franklin Graham uh, to try to answer questions about that. But still, the people most likely to decide not to take advantage of the vaccines were my people, the white evangelical church. We now know that as a consequence of the fact about 50 million Americans decided this was not for them, that there really were quite serious consequences. Kaiser Family Foundation estimates, and this is not a political group, they're just looking at the data, that some 234,000 people died unnecessarily of COVID-19 because they didn't trust the vaccines that might have saved them. In the midst of all this, deep divisions were clear in the country. I was called many times uh, to speak on press events like MSNBC or CNN or Fox News. And those were always short intervals where you were supposed to say something that sounded convincing. And to be honest, I'm not sure I did a great job of that. And I'm sure I didn't do a very good job of explaining how this was such a moving target. And there were so many times where we were doing the best we could with imperfect information, but it was likely to need to change. The divisions in the country got nasty. I got personal threats to myself and my family, including at least one person who threatened to do things to my two adult daughters that ultimately the FBI was able to track down and that person is in jail. I never expected that was the sort of thing that would happen in the United States of America about something like public health. But that is the direction that everything seemed to be going. And to be honest, I don't think we're past that yet. So I did step down in December of 2021, uh, to be honest, pretty exhausted uh, from this experience, but also really trying to understand how is it that when the development of these vaccines seemed to those of us involved and will seem, I think, to historians as one of the most amazing achievements of science uh, in the history of humanity, that it ended up, in many people's minds, being seen very differently as something dangerous and threatening and maybe even a conspiracy to hurt people. I needed to understand exactly how we got to that point. And that led to my reaching out to David Blankenhorn, uh, Braver Angels. I was tipped off about Braver Angels by my friend David Brooks, who's a writer whose work you might have seen, and who had also had an experience with him that led him to think Braver Angels might be the place where we could really have these conversations, where people would really listen to each other, learn from each other, not try to convince people uh, that they're wrong and I'm right, but basically try to see where has the divisiveness of our country come from and how can we better understand it so that we can get back in a place of respecting each other and working together. So I signed up for a number of sessions with Braver Angels. I was assigned as a 
partner, a sort of alter ego, um, a wonderful guy in Minnesota, uh, Wilk Wilkerson, who runs a trucking company and who is very much in the space of feeling that the public health recommendations during COVID uh, were uh, elitist. Uh, they were done in a fashion that did not take account of what the real experience was in his part of the world. Uh, and they were unnecessarily treading upon uh, human liberties and doing harm with things like business closures uh, to the economy and certainly to children's learning capabilities by school closures that went on much longer than they should have. I probably spent 15 or 20 hours with Wilk in various settings, and I think I've learned some things about this that have been very helpful, although not easy to appreciate. I didn't really know until spending time with him and multiple other people in these Braver Angel sessions, on just how different COVID felt uh, to people in the heartland than it did uh, to somebody like me uh, in the urban areas on the coast that the heartland may not have seen that this was actually all that much of an urgent crisis, and yet they were being told to shut down their businesses and schools, even when the hospitals had seen very little in the way of evidence of disease. Now, it got there at certain points, but the discordance between the recommendations, which seemed to be focused particularly on the places hardest hit in the big cities, and how that affected those in other parts of the country was glaring. It was also clear that the way in which the recommendations changed over time, and I'll particularly point to masking, which was initially said not to be necessary, and then a month later uh, said to be very necessary, that seemed to be manipulative. And we did a poor job of explaining how that came about because of the realization that this virus, unlike other coronaviruses, is incredibly infectious for people who have no symptoms. We didn't think that was going to be the case. If you're going to be infectious only when you're sick, then there's no point in asking people to wear masks when they feel fine. But that didn't work for COVID. And so the change was made. But I don't think the reasons for that came across. It seemed arbitrary, capricious, manipulative, and people began to doubt whether the public health voice persons, and I was one of them, actually had the public's interest at heart, or whether they were kind of jerking people around. You know, trust is a really critical issue. Trust has two components. My friend Yuval Levin has recently clarified this for me. One of it is competence. That is, do you trust somebody to actually know what they're talking about? Uh, do they have the facts? But that's not all of it. It's also about restraint. Does that expert who has competence in a certain area have a tendency to then reach into other areas and tell you how to run your life when they don't have competence in that place? And I think a lot of people thought maybe that was the line that got crossed in the space of these recommendations about COVID. At least that may have been part of it. So what should we have done differently? Well, a lot. I wish, of course, that we had already known everything there was to know about this virus before it emerged, but that was not to be. I think during our communications, we should have done a better job every time of explaining the uncertainty. The fact that we really had a very limited amount of information. It was growing by the week, but it was limited at the beginning about this virus and what to expect. I mean, look at the predictions in the first couple of months of COVID-19 about how serious it was going to be. They were all over the map. And that's not because people were stupid. We just didn't have enough data to know what to say. We should have taken better account of the differences in communities and provided more opportunity for local authorities uh, to make decisions about things like when school closures could be lifted. Provide more autonomy for communities. Another thing that happened very much from my perspective, I'm a physician. Most of the people around me uh, who were part of this group trying to decide what recommendations to make, and CDC, of course, was in the lead to actually make those recommendations. Most of us are physicians. And our tendency, therefore, was to make 
every decision on the basis of saving lives and to have that basically so compelling that other factors like economics or children's uh, schooling opportunities were sufficiently less important that they could wait. And I think in retrospect, we should have had a broader, more holistic view of what the consequences were going to be. Yes, I will certainly advocate that savings lives is our number one priority, but it maybe is not the only priority. So now what do we do? We've lost a lot of trust in people who serve in public health, and many of them have been badly demonized, uh, sometimes threatened, and many have decided they can't do this anymore. Our workforce for public health has been pretty badly injured. We have to come up with a way uh, to regain uh, the kind of uh, uh, appreciation for public health experts uh, so that they won't be scared off. We haven't done a very good job of giving them a sense of how much value they really should have. That is going to be a big task coming forward. Our communication going forward is going to have to be much more clear. It's going to need to engage local experts and not just national talking heads. And frankly, the areas that have caused so much trouble in terms of distribution of misinformation and even intentional disinformation are going to need to be better understood uh, by all of us. Some of those uh, in, uh, information sources are actually malevolent uh, and are intend to do us harm, but it's not always easy to see that. We seem to have a sense as a country that we don't want that social media voice uh, to be overly constrained. We don't want censorship, but that means that then we have to have public sensitivity uh, to information that's actually wrong false and dangerous, and we don't all just hit the retweet uh, when one of those things comes along, because it turns out that information that induces anger, fear, and anxiety spreads like wildfire. Information that's accurate and comforting spreads much more slowly. So we've got a really serious problem with social media. Some would argue that the next time we could probably anticipate what the conspiracies would be, and maybe we could even warn people, when you hear this, <laughs> be on your guard, immunize against conspiracies would be the argument. We didn't do that this time. Uh, we weren't prepared. I don't think most people realized just how strong that influence was going to be. So we have a lot of work to do, and we better think about it and maybe uh, not wait too long, because this is not the last pandemic that our species will face. With all the factors that play into that, with humans getting increasingly close to animal species that carry viruses and then can jump across, uh, with climate change also changing the domains of, of some of these pathogens, uh, we are going to have other examples, hopefully not as bad as this one, but I can't tell you it won't be. We felt like we'd been overdue for an influenza epidemic, and we still are. Maybe that'll be the next one. but. We need to use this time as people who have suffered a lot, but have learned something to try to figure out how we can be better prepared the next time. That would certainly be my goal, but we have a long way to go before I think we could say those lessons are all learned and we're now better prepared for the next one. We still seem to be in a country that has more divisions uh, than the sense that we need to work together. So thanks, I will stop there at 35 minutes past the hour, and I will be glad to hear what questions you all have, and I'll do my best to try to answer them. All right. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Dr. Collins. I will, we've got a list here. Um, thank you for those that have submitted questions. We're going to try to work through them. Um, you, you addressed the first one I'll ask um, that was submitted is many people feel like the mRNA vaccines are too risky compared to traditional vaccines. Um, do you think they're more risky? I don't. Um, clearly, 
the COVID-19 vaccine program was the first time they had been carried all the way through uh, to a major vaccination program. But the science behind mRNA vaccines had been understudied rather vigorously uh, for about 25 years. And there was already a program underway to try to develop an mRNA for a different coronavirus, the one called MERS. And that made it possible uh, to jump quickly uh, into doing the same for SARS-CoV-2. Certainly, this kind of technology needs close scrutiny. That's why we do clinical trials. And to have these mRNA vaccines, both Pfizer and Moderna, uh, tested in more than 30,000 people each gave you a very clear sense. If there was going to be a safety signal, you would see it. And yet, in those very large numbers, there was nothing there uh, to cause a sense of concern. We have a lot more follow-up now, because uh, many of those people, well, including me, have now been immunized uh, over the course of more than two years. And there does not seem to be a long-term surprise here either. And by the way, long-term surprises from vaccines uh, are very unusual if they happen, no matter what the particular reason is for creating the antigen that results in the immune response. So I think the question is right. We should look at anything like this uh, with skepticism. Is it really going to be safe and collect the data? But based on the data right now, I think mRNA vaccines appear to be uh, remarkably safe. And I'm excited to see that we're now starting to think of ways we could use those in a field like cancer, because Cancer vaccines are showing great promise for people who otherwise don't have an effective treatment. And the mRNA vaccine can be made quickly enough that somebody with stage four cancer might still be able to benefit from it and not have to wait too long uh, for it to become available. So mRNA vaccines are a, um, it's a advance that here to stay. And you might've noticed the Nobel prize uh, just last week uh, going uh, to Catalina Carrico and Drew Weissman uh, for the work that they did to turn this into a reality. Thank you. Um, I don't, you, you touched on the next one here a little bit already, but I'll ask it is trust in institutions and experts was a contentious issue. Um, and you mentioned we need to rebuild trust. Um, what, what, do you know what is currently being done? what NIH, CDC, our government's doing or what they should be doing? I think the government is a bit in a tough spot here since a lot of the distrust is directed at the government. And I think if trust is going to be regained, it may need to come from other sources uh, other than the government seeming just to defend itself. Um, I'm still a federal employee doing a research project uh, at the NIH. I'm not in a position to tell uh, the institution what to do about communication or regaining a trust, but I am very concerned uh, to see the way in which statistically uh, this has taken a nosedive in the course of the last four or five years. So I would say from the view of everybody, and this ought to be something the braver angels would be concerned about, that loss of trust ultimately is a bad thing uh, for the future of our society. Uh, science is the way in which we can find out truth about how nature works and how disease happens and what to do about it. I think most people still believe there is such a thing as objective truth, <laughs> despite the questions on some corners about that. And if it's a truth you're interested in about something to do with health and medicine, you're gonna need science uh, to get that for you. And you're gonna need experts uh, who can basically explain what is known, hopefully without getting outside uh, of their zones of expertise. And the experts need to have more credibility than the latest post on Facebook uh, by somebody who just put up something that's going to make you mad. I think as a nation, we're going to have to get better at discriminating those sources and figure out what is trustworthy and then put our trust in the right place where the trustworthiness belongs. Because there's a lot of instances where I don't think that's gone very well. I'm disturbed that in some people's minds, anybody who is an expert is sort of automatically suspect. 
but if you want an answer to something that's really important to you and you have somebody who's spent 20 years of their life trying to get that answer, that's probably a better place to go uh, than somebody who just popped up somewhere on cable news or social media and may actually have an agenda to sell you something. We need to regain our sense of uh, understanding how to be critical and skeptical of information and understand the difference between things that might sound good or might sound awful and just get you out and things that actually have the ring of truth. There is truth to be found. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Um, some citizens have raised questions about the accuracy and transparency of the COVID-19 data. What steps can be taken going forward to ensure the data used for decision-making and a crisis is accurate and transparent. It's, um, yeah. And, and I, I can't help but think about, I watched your um, recording with Wilk at the national convention. I can't, and it shouldn't surprise me having my wife being a former federal employee and me working for a Navy contracts that you had data coming in by fax, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't serve well for timely inaccuracy. Well, that was part of the issue for sure. We had let our public health system really deteriorate uh, in this country over the course of the past few decades. Most of those public health systems are supported by states and by cities and counties. And that was often a place uh, to make a budget cut because there didn't seem to be an urgency at the time. And so when CDC is trying to find out what's happening in our country at a time where there's a COVID crisis, they are really hamstrung. And as you just said, yes, some of the data was being sent in by a fax machine. Yeah, in 2020, a fax machines. Can you imagine that? Because that's what they had. It was very frustrating uh, that as we were trying to figure out what was happening with this epidemic, we could get better data from South Africa than we could get from the United States of America and much of the ability to understand the course of the pandemic uh, also came from Israel that had a very good data collection plan. And ours was routinely months behind because of this broken system. So that was a problem. Uh, we were dealing oftentimes uh, with out-of-date information. When it comes to things like, was the vaccine safe? Uh, that's the kind of thing where there is a very rigorous a protocol uh, for collecting the data from all the participants done, as I said, all double blinded and watched over by a data safety monitoring board. And all of that data, once it is unblinded and the results are known, gets published uh, in a very visible place, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, traditionally for something that is highly visible. And anybody who wants to see what the details were, can have access to that and make their own decision whether they think the conclusions are justified. That is the standard uh, in science. If you're going to claim something, you have to publish your data in a peer-reviewed journal, which means other peers have to look at it and see if they agree with you. And only then is it considered to be established. Now, I will say during COVID-19, when there was an awful lot of research getting done in a hurry and it needed to be, uh, a lot of that information got initially posted in something called preprint servers, which were not peer reviewed. The bonus of that was you got to see the data much sooner, but the caveat was you better watch out. Some of this is probably wrong. I still think it was better to know than not to know, but it really meant everybody had to be quite careful and scrutinize those preprints uh, to be sure that there wasn't something that looked a little off. Uh, what we learned from those often, though, helped us uh, find out something two or three months sooner than we would have. Alrighty, thank you. <clears throat> Next question is, how do you, well, and you talked a little bit about it, you touched on it with the data reporting, but how do you see the balance between federal guidelines and state autonomy when mentioning a crisis like COVID-19? Yeah, that's a great question. We are one country, and of course, viruses don't care at all about state lines. So there's a lot to be said for trying to have a national public health strategy 
when we're looking at the big picture. But certainly local environments are different. And so the importance of having that considered and making specific recommendations about things like business closures and school closures uh, makes a lot of sense. If you have the expertise to do so, this sort of brings us back though to the fact that many of the public health departments were sufficiently decimated by previous neglect that they weren't really in a very good position to take that on. What I wouldn't wanna see, but which we did see quite a bit of, was political figures deciding to make public health recommendations in the absence of any real expertise at all. Uh, that's not a good solution. And certainly I would think uh, for people who are interested in the best outcome, uh, that ought not to be something uh, to celebrate. So in an ideal world, national broad-based recommendations based on the best data that we've got, and then with local abilities uh, to do some modifications uh, to maximize uh, the outcomes for their communities and not have it be a completely one-size-fits-all situation because oftentimes one size doesn't fit all. Okay, so there, there's a question. I, I've, I'm gonna ask one, <clears throat> I've been curious. Um, so some of the recommendations, some of the lockdown, some of the isolation, are, are we, is there any data that suggests we're seeing an uptick in um, maybe some ne in negative trends like obesity, cardiovascular disease, and maybe death, even an increase in death from some of those comorbidities? Because, you know, people, if you can believe the data, like a lot of people sat home and gained 20 pounds. Mm. Well, it sure didn't help. <laughs> and there are... Yeah. Um... I haven't seen the sort of nationwide data to see what the overall gain in the uh, national BMI was, but there was some, uh, at least uh, uh, in some places, in some people. In terms of the health consequences, I think a particularly troubling one has been what's happened with cancer because cancer screenings, which required you to go to a clinic or a hospital for a colonoscopy or a mammogram or something like that, uh, basically dropped uh, deeply uh, from where they should have been. And so a lot of delays happened. And we are now seeing uh, an uptick in new diagnoses of cancer that I think it would not be at this level uh, had it not been for the neglect over those two or three years. Understandable neglect because people were afraid uh, to go to a, a, a medical facility uh, when they didn't know how many other people with COVID might be there trying to get care. So that was a significant issue. Um, I don't know about obesity uh, of a medically significant sort. Um, it's a good question. There's probably somebody collecting that data now. Just, I'm just curious because I know that if I look at CDC information, right, that um, cardiovascular disease is still our number one enemy in this country. Yes. Okay. So um, I don't know much about this one, but I'm going to ask for someone is, what is your view of the disagreement with the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration? I'll be glad to respond to okay. that because I think a lot of people have wondered about that. Let me just describe what that was. Uh, it was early October of 2020. October 5th, I think, uh, where three epidemiologists uh, met uh, in Western Massachusetts in a town called Great Barrington and put together a one page declaration, which basically recommended that the closures and the other kinds of mitigation be stopped except for people over 65. Uh, that Basically, there was more harm than good uh, from all of these um, mitigations, and it would be better to just let the virus run its course in people who could probably handle it as long as the most vulnerable people were kept uh, safe. Um, this was presented in an interesting way. If it had been submitted to a scientific journal where there could have then been a debate about it, uh, that, I think, could have been a useful development, but it was essentially a political document, which the day that it was released was presented to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, 
um, and was embraced uh, um, rather uh, strongly by Dr. Scott Atlas, who was, after all, advising the president and seemed as if it was on a fast track uh, to utterly change the way in which we would approach COVID-19. Keep in mind, there is no vaccine at that point. We didn't know if there would be. Keep in mind also that looking at the death rates, fully a third of the people who were dying of COVID-19 were under 65. So it's not as if one could decide to just protect the elderly and everybody else would be okay. There would be consequences here in terms of deaths. And it also seemed to many of us really impractical that you could really isolate uh, the elderly. They still had to have people around them and it seemed unlikely they could really be protected uh, from infection. So I was alarmed by this as were many other people. Uh, the public health associations wrote a scathing takedown of this uh, about um, 10 days later, 14 different public health organizations saying, this is truly dangerous. Uh, there was a memorandum called the John Snow Memorandum where a bunch of epidemiologists took also great offense at what the Great Barrington Declaration authors had said. And it didn't happen, which I think is a good thing. I wrote an email uh, to Dr. Fauci, who at that point was reporting to me, expressing concern about this. Being a government employee, all of my emails eventually become public. And I made a comment that I thought this was dangerous and something should be done uh, in the way of a takedown of it so that it would not gather momentum in the White House. Um, that is now seen by some people um, as an indication that I was trying to squash scientific debate. I was basically trying to prevent what I was afraid might be a really bad decision from happening very hastily before there was time for any debate. But I will allow us how it was not my highest moment uh, in terms of the choice of words to put in an email, never dreaming that it would become such a topic of great interest. There's now, it seems, some efforts um, by the authors of that declaration, particularly Professor Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford, to say they were right and that basically they were suppressed uh, by governments. And uh, if that had been followed up, things would have turned out better. I totally disagree with that. I think if that had been put forward, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds, 100,000 or more people would have died unnecessarily. And I think I can back that up uh, by evidence uh, comparing other situations where that kind of uh, opportunity occurred as recently as in China when they finally decided to let the virus go. So that's what it is. That's a long answer to the Great Barrington Declaration, but it's out there. I think it's troubling a lot of people. I'd want to reassure people. It was one of those moments where had it been allowed to be a good scientific discussion, it would have been useful, but it got put forward in a very odd way um, yeah, to try to short circuit, circuit that. And that led to an outcry uh, from lots of people, including me. Thank you. Oh, we do, we're doing good on time. We have time for a few more. Next question. So if developed, would a test for immunity rather than infection have changed our approach to lockdowns? Um, that's a really good question. Somebody's really thinking about this. It might have helped. I think there was a sense that the government and people like me were not that interested in natural immunity that happens when somebody gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. And I'll be honest, we didn't talk about it as much as maybe we should have because we're so focused on trying to get people vaccinated. Uh, we didn't have a broadly available test for immunity. Uh, we do now, although it's not easily done sort of uh, in a, a large scale way. Yeah, let's turn the clock back. Suppose we had a simple point of care test uh, for immunity and it would have been possible to predict with good accuracy uh, whether somebody was vulnerable to infection or not. It might have helped uh, with the fine tuning uh, of how to do uh, decision makings about lockdown. But let me just quickly say also, it wouldn't have been perfect. The other thing about SARS-CoV-2, which we were not expecting, at least I wasn't, and which turned out to be a really vexing part of this whole experience was its ability to change its spike protein coat uh, at a pace that hadn't really been expected. Uh, so we went from the original virus 
And then we had alpha and beta, and then we had delta, which was really bad. And then, oh my God, we had Omicron with its vast number of new mutations uh, appearing, which were not expected and made it almost like a completely new virus, which meant that your previous immunity, um, whether if you had Delta before, you weren't necessarily protected from Omicron. So all of that made the possibility of this kind of prediction about who's really safe and who isn't uh, not as good as you would have wanted. It might've helped, but it would have been a complicated calculus. It would have been tough to do it in an objective and entirely fair fashion. Thank you. Um, since we're almost out of time, um, I like this one here. What ha what have we not asked you? And there's a lot of questions, so we're, we're not going to get through them all. But what have we not asked you that you would like us to know or have us think about going forward from this meeting? Well, it's been a really good set of questions. So I'm glad, first of all, this meeting is happening and I hope many others are as well. Um, I guess my deep concern um, is really about how we figure out as a country uh, to set aside the tribal divisions that we have found our way into and try to replace misinformation uh, with real information. And I'm not sure right now exactly what the best path uh, to do that would be. So certainly that whole process of who do you trust and how do you re regain trust uh, in sources of expertise uh, needs uh, to be recovered. The other thing I would say, which I haven't touched on that much, but I guess I should right now, is it's deeply unfortunate that this became a political issue. Whether COVID-19 uh, is going to cause you serious illness or not, it isn't really going to matter that much what your political party is. And yet that became a driving force. Uh, we can see the way in which vaccine resistance uh, was much more likely in one party than another. And you can see the way that played out, a recent publication showing that that had a real impact in terms of what happened to people. Politics and public health really don't mix, and that we allowed that to happen and that it's still happening, and that certain politicians seem willing to use that kind of position when they don't have the expertise uh, to basically spread around information that may not be true is disgraceful, especially if it involves their efforts to then go out and raise money on those particular statements. So in the future, could we please decide <laughs> when there's a public health issue, let's not have the politicians be the ones who are driving the conversation forward. That has been one of the most unfortunate parts of this unfortunate experience. Well, thank you, Dr. Collins. <clears throat> there are many, many more <laughs> questions. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to them all. <laughs> 